thank you all for coming. I think most of you probably heard about this through our site, Skate City. Um, we've been running events like this for about two years out of London, and this is our first uh, proper New York event, so I'm really pleased to have all of you here. Um, but, you know, it's great to have the guys from Tough Mudder here, and for me, I think it's probably one of my favorite startup stories in New York. I think it's probably because of where they've come from in terms of their backgrounds and professional careers. I mean, with Guy being, you know, corporate law and Will, I guess, James Bond, something like something, James Bond S, uh, which we'll talk about. So I think it just sort of shows that you can go from something, you know, completely different to uh, starting something that's also, you know, vastly different from your professional background. And so they'll go through the steps today and how they've built such a successful company in such a short period of time. So thanks very much, and I'll turn it over to them. Okay. Thank you, guys. Well, um, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here today. I'm very flattered to see so many people looking at us. Um, I will. Uh, we'll try and keep this relatively short, and then hopefully there'll be time to meet some of our team and uh, questions at the end of this. But we're going to give you a quick overview of the story of our uh, tough mother. So let's see if we can get that slide. I think the colours are a little out there, so we can around. But well, I could. Let me. It's fine. Um, can everyone hear the back, by the way? Yeah, see? So, so this is me. Um, uh, I uh, came to the States five years ago. I got my MBA at uh, HBS. Um, prior to that, I was a British government council terrorism <laughs> officer. Um, so it's something like being a James Bond, but maybe not quite as exciting as that. And I did that for five years prior to that. Um, uh, I'll talk a lot to you in the next couple minutes, but I'll hand over to Guy for the first few minutes. Hi everyone, um, obviously I'm Guy, I'm the uh, co-founder and chief operating officer of Tough Mudder. Um, my background, as uh, Mikey alluded to uh, before, is I used to be a, a corporate lawyer um, back in London, where I used to obviously wear a grey suit every day. I used to say that you know, we used to work in the vertical coffin as the undead sort of rose up the skyscraper <laughs> into this kind of nothingness. And it was a revelation to me, to be honest, that I could, uh, that work could be fun. Um, because frankly, and I'm sure there's maybe some people who disagree, but um, corporate law for me was never, ever any fun. And it, it was uh, with quite a lot of excitement, really, when uh, Will said to me, um, you know, I'm starting up a business in New York, do you want to get involved? And honestly, it didn't take very much more than a, hmm, that sounds interesting, yes, and I was on a flight out here. Um, I think um, we as a company, Tough Mudder, probably epitomise what um, Escape the City is all about, or Escape. Um, we are a, a company that, um, that, that operates or has so many of our sort of key team have, uh, have escaped their corporate world, we want to do something really fun, sort of cast off the shackles, uh, so to speak, of, of banking or consultancy. And we've got a number of our team uh, scattered in and around you guys uh, tonight, uh, tonight, and I'm hoping at the end of this, um, a lot of you will have the opportunity to speak to them about you know, what it's like to work at Tough Mudder. I'm going to give you uh, a very quick overview of what we're going to be speaking to tonight. Um, so we're going to be speaking about how we're sort of bootstrapped from $10,000 initial investment to become a $70 million by revenue business. We're going to be talking about how to build, or how we built, a disruptive product in our space. Speaking about how to develop an offline viral product how we're partnering with global multinational brands. And finally, and perhaps the most interesting, but certainly from my perspective, is how we create, hopefully creating, a really fun, sustainable uh, company culture. Thank you. So let me uh, kick off by talking to you a little bit about what the idea was. And it really starts with saying that marathons are a little boring. Um, and uh, now I found myself in my second year at Harvard Business School thinking, what the hell am I doing here? I was surrounded by people that were going into private equity and management consultancy. And I was going through a whole bunch of ideas at the time. I knew I didn't want to raise venture capital. Um, and that kind of limited my options for what I might be doing. And I was getting into triathlon and marathon at the time. And I found as enjoyable as elements of it was that there was something a little bit boring about the training components of it, that it was missing the camaraderie that I was looking for. And I thought I need to create something that makes running fun. And my background, I spent a lot of time in the Middle East with special forces guys, and I was trying to capture elements of what their training's about, which is all about getting outside of your comfort zone and doing stuff that's a little weird and a little wacky. But at the same time, and I think this is really important when it comes to speaking about our company culture, 
um, having an event that uh, isn't a race where people don't take themselves too seriously. Um, and the concept slowly evolved over time, but it, um, and I thought more and more about it whilst I was at business school, and it, it seemed it was going to be about a 10 to 12 mile military style obstacle course uh, with a number of obstacles around, and with this sense that it's an all round test. Every professor at Harvard Business School told me this was a terrible idea, um, and I should take that job at Bain. Um, pretty much all of my uh, colleagues at the business school said the same thing to me, and none of them were certainly interested in starting a, a mother on business with me. But uh, that was the idea, and I will talk a little bit more over the next few slides about some of the underlying trends uh, that we thought that we were tapping into uh, when I came up with the uh, business idea. So we're going to run a very quick video now that I could talk a lot about the event, but it's probably going to be easier to watch a short video, and it'll give you a sense of what it's about for those of you that don't know. We came from all over the country for one reason, one reason only, to prove that you can do this, you can do anything you put your heart and your mind to. We are Tough Mother! something of an idea of what the event is about. It's, uh, it's about teamwork, it's about camaraderie, it's unequivocally not a race. That's a big part of it. Um, I apologise that the, some of that's uh, hanging off the side there, but the backstory to this is um, that uh, I graduated in 2009, had a ton of debt from business school, had very little money at that time, and so we were trying to uh, put together the absolute minimal viable product, something that allowed us to test our assumptions um, that we had that we thought we needed to have some idea of before we really launched this thing in a major way. And for those of you that are not familiar with Erin Reese's uh, book, The Lean Startup, I really recommend it for anyone thinking about doing anything in uh, an entrepreneurial endeavor. It's a great book. But you can see it's a very basic um, website. I wasn't familiar with Wix.com at the time, so uh, I uh, didn't. Um, uh, I didn't know about that, but so we had some guy in the Ukraine build that for $300 for us. Um, <laughs> we had um, we spent $20 on Facebook ads, and the response, simply in terms of pre-registrations, was pretty insane for us. Um, and at that point, I was getting pretty excited. I had no idea of what was going to come. I uh, graduated, um, had the summer off. That was important for me, and then started the business in October time. And the guy came on board at that time. He came over here, never been to the US before, slept on my couch for the first month or two um, as we were starting this. We launched still really quite a simple website for $4,000. Um, we had, we, it says 10,000, there was actually 8,200. I know exactly how much it was because it was how much we had in our bank account at the time once we found our first venue. Um, so that's what we had to spend um, uh, for the event. And then we had our first event in April 2010 in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Um, and we were hoping for 500 people at this event. 
Um, that was, we thought, break even. As it turned out, we had no idea about our costs, so break even was more like 2,000. But we sold out 5,000 spots in five weeks, and that was just doing Facebook advertising. Um, and I remember the first day, we had like three sales, then five sales, then five sales, and three sales, and then none, and stop worrying, and then stays like that for a bit. And then all of a sudden, the momentum just picked up, and I remember we had a day that we had 10, then we had 20, and then we had 200 in a day. Which is funny, because now we sell 3,000 spots a day, and we consider it a bad day. But I remember when we hit 200 in the first day, and it was some of the most exciting times, I think, for the company. And the whole time, it was just me and Guy working on our kitchen table. And then we were very fortunate we had a New York Times article, which I think really helped just before our first event. But that was the kind of the backstory of us bootstrapping at the very start. Um, and since then, we've been incredibly fortunate. We've had a ton of press. Um, just to give you some of the uh, stuff we've had, we've been in pretty much, we've been on pretty much all the major networks now. We've had quite a lot of publications in most of the major newspapers over here. We've had a lot of uh, coverage in our international markets in the UK and in Aus Australia as well. Um, and I remember being very surprised that this New York Times article, which was a feature about us, was the fourth most uh, forwarded article of the uh, day. Um, and I think it talks about Under Armour, our partner, one of our partners there, and how much press we got from that. And I think, you know, people always say, did I expect it to be this successful? And most entrepreneurs are saying, well, it's kind of like that. The truth is, and I have to be honest with all of you, this is like 100 times bigger than we ever thought it would be. Our projection was that we'd have 5,000 people doing our events in year three. And that was our optimistic forecast. And as you'll see, we're hoping to do more like half a million this year. Um, so let me talk very quickly about some of the economics of the business. We are a profitable business. We're fortunate that people pay us in advance. It was one of the nice things, and as I mentioned, one of the reasons why we didn't have to raise venture capital. 2010, there is a small line hiding down there that shows our revenues in the first year. Back then, we were quite pleased with that. Um, fast forward to this year, we're doing 35 events um, globally, um, including about 25 here in the US, and that's going to put us somewhere in the region of $70 million in revenue. So our headcount's now around 60. Our hope is that it'll be well over 100 by the end of the year. In fact, we're hoping to have 140 people in our Dumbo headquarters in Brooklyn, New York, by the end of the year. And the vast majority of that comes through participant entry fees. We have some other revenue streams through sponsorship and the like, but the main one is our uh, entry fees. So I shall, I think, hand over. No, I apologize. It's a little bit more for me. So somewhere in the black in the background there, there are lots of dots of the United uh, flags in various cities in the United States. Very important to us um, that we generated not just a national brand here in the US, but a global brand. We looked at what Ironman had done within the triathlon space and how they owned the distance triathlon space, and they were de facto the name. Um, and so we really focused on a very rapid rollout across the United States. Our biggest events to date have been around 20,000 people. We're doing an event in New Jersey this fall that we wanted to be 50,000 people in one day. We're trying to go head to head with the New York Marathon and have more people doing our event than the New York Marathon. Um, but we have a, a national network of events all over the country, and we see diehards coming and doing all of our events and traveling around the country. We've had a thousand people get the Tough Mudder logo tattooed on them, so we think that speaks something to our brand. <laughs> um, and there you can see some of what we're doing. So we're in Canada, uh, the UK, we have three events this year. Uh, Australia, I'm heading out there tomorrow um, for our first event in Melbourne. That's going to be a 20,000 person <laughs> event for us. It's our first event in Australia. People warned us the Australians would go crazy for this, and we were proven entirely right on that. So that's going to be fun. That's our first international event. That's in a week or so's time. Cool. So building a disruptive, uh, disruptive product. So. You know, Will uh, sort of alluded it to um, earlier about the fact that you know, he, he thought that the uh, endurance space, um, you know, was would look good. You know, the triathlons and marathons were pretty boring. Yeah? So have a hands up for people who've done a triathlon or a marathon or a ten k. So a lot of people here. I'd say roughly fifty percent. I mean, you can see the size of the endurance market in the U.S. 500,000 uh, 500, um, marathon finishers estimated, I think, for uh, 2010. One and a half million, roughly, for half marathon. Nearly two million for triathlon. That's a huge number of people, just of people who are athletically inclined and want to take part in the endurance uh, space market. But as Will pointed out, you know, marathons are pretty boring. 
uh, triathlons are pretty boring and they're also phenomenally badly run as well and that's for us max of just a huge huge opportunity um, um, <coughs> so you know we thought there was a real opportunity to build something that was um, completely different to um, marathons or triathlons which are you know competitive you know it's absolutely we say our things are not a race we never use the R word uh, around tough mother it is emphatically a challenge and not a race and to that extent you know people thought we were mad um, to say and everyone said you need timing chips you need to have you know put competition in there but actually that's completely wrong the reason why we've been so successful is we're offering a product to people who are athletically minded who don't want that uh, that kind of competitive um, aspect of stuff. Um, so we'll click on again, and you'll see uh, our number of participants here. Um, obviously, 140,000 last year. We're projecting 400,000 this year. Actually, that's now conservative. And um, if you look on the previous slide, you know we will have more people doing our event this year than actually completed a marathon in the U.S. two years ago. That just goes to show. Um, the size of the market. And then in terms of the people who run these events, you know, it's, it's a funny world endurance sports, which is why we thought just the event space in general um, was such an enormous opportunity for us. Um, triathlons are typically organised by the guy who was probably the best at triathlon in the like, mid-80s, and one way or another he now runs the, the triathlon in his local city. Very few people have come in there and said, actually, um, this is, there's an opportunity here to professionalise, to properly market events uh, in the way that we have. Will will be talking in, in a second about how we market in a kind of viral fashion, which is so so different to uh, to the rest of um, the kind of the industry. But I think it's uh, important to say, you know, you know, we weren't the first to market, um, but we were the um, we were a sort of fast follower. Um, I don't know if many of you here have heard of Warrior Dash which puts on a, uh, a three mile equivalent to what may on the outside look as though it's um, the same. It's, it's an obstacle course run, but it's about 5K, but they have very, very different demographics to, uh, to what we have, where you know, our age demographic trends to about sort of age 30 as opposed to 22, and it's a genuine challenge that people can talk about. I think one thing that uh, Will hasn't mentioned, but I think is worth mentioning is, what, uh, and in terms of building a disruptive uh, product is the fact that we, um, we've iterated massively since we started. We actually started off thinking that the market wanted, based on the focus groups that Will had done at Harvard, a sort of a six to seven mile event. And as you've seen, we now do 10 to 12 mile uh, events. And we, so we've really listened to uh, our sort of demographics, constantly getting feedback in from them through post-event surveys, to feedback, what people are really, uh, really asking for. Um, and I think what our unique value proposition is, uh, is our brand, you know. We're known for our obstacles that are really, really cool. Um, and this is the, uh, the, this kind of idea that the brand is our um, unique sort of value proposition um, is really, really important to how we market the event. Um, and I think it also uh, speaks to kind of the culture that we're trying to create as a company as well. Um, you know, we really, uh, really emphasise the fact that um, you know, it's a fun place to work. We don't take ourselves seriously. And we can be very, very professional in the way that we operate, um, but that's not the only thing that's important. We don't take ourselves too seriously at all. Thank you. So I mentioned that I was going to talk a little bit to you guys about some of the trends that uh, people talk about. And whenever I go to entrepreneurship conferences, everyone talks about touch and mobile computing devices and all these exciting things. And you know, we're not a tech business. You know, we're a rare example of a high growth entrepreneurial business. It's not a tech business, um, uh, which is strange, I think, in this space. Most people I meet um, are a tech entrepreneur. And I think if I looked at some of the trends that I think we've tapped into, it's not just the long run trend of the last 20 years in fitness, it's the trend of the last couple of years to functional fitness, and also the trend towards exercising as a group and it being a more social activity. And I think cr what CrossFit's done very well, for those of you that are familiar with CrossFit, is really uh, made exercise about doing it with your friends and getting a social network through that. Um, something else we really saw was this sense that experience is the new luxury good. Um, and this is the thing that people, particularly the Gen Y crowd, but also the Gen X crowd, will pay a lot of money for, I'm sure. 
many of you have seen on Facebook you know, the term humble brag, you know, people talking about things they did, really that kind of bragging about how accomplished they are and the things they've done. Um, and certainly something I find very telling when I ask my friends or even my colleagues that, uh, at Tough Mudder what they did at the weekend, they either tell me about something awesome they did or they said I just chilled. Now, there's no middle ground anymore. People don't say, well, I had quite a nice time and I cleaned out my closet. closet. It's just, people don't say that stuff anymore. And I think there's the sense that memories, particularly shared memories, um, are this experience that, unlike your iPhone, which is going to be out of date pretty soon, if anything, appreciates in value over time. And I think in this age where everyone's so busy and the frequency with which you get to see your friends is reduced and the ability to do things like join softball leagues is reduced, Tough Mudder is something there. So there's a number of trends that um, we've tapped into, but I want to talk specifically about the viral component. You know, people tell their friends about the fact they're doing Tough Mudder. They build teams um, to come and do a Tough Mudder. They recruit their friends, but they also brag to others that they're doing a Tough Mudder. And I think this side speaks to that. We are one of, we believe, Facebook won't confirm this, but one of Facebook's largest advertisers. Um, I should hesitate to say they make most of their money from online gaming, but we're a big chunk of their advertising revenue. Um, and you can see here from what we're doing, it's Facebook, Facebook ads, Facebook posts, driving this word of mouth. So it all happens offline. Um, it's people talking about doing the event uh, with their friends and saying how cool it is. And I have this joke, we, I, we say it's a joke, but it's a strategic aim of the business. We're trying to build a household name. And we want to get to a level where people are doing our events and when a guy goes into a bar, he thinks when he tells a girl that he's doing the Tough Mudder that that girl knows what he's talking about. And that for us will be the sign that we've arrived. The guys are doing our event because they think when they tell a girl in a bar, it'll impress her. Now whether the girl is impressed or not is frankly irrelevant as far as we're concerned. The important thing is the guy thinks. So that's, a, that's part of what our brand's about. As you can see, word of mouth is just huge. And I think this, the reason it's been so big is this sense that we're tapping into humble brags, people building teams, wanting to do things with their friends at a level that you just didn't see even five or ten years ago. Next up. Um, and here we are, this viral product, and, and I've already touched on this. We believe there's a huge first mover advantage. You can become the real thing. If you're going to do a distance triathlon, and you're going to train very hard, you're going to do the Ironman. And I believe in the tough mud run space, and there's nothing wrong with Warrior Dash. People always say, why do you hate Warrior Dash? We don't. They're just not a competitor to us. They're a, three mile event, it's a lot of fun, and it's over in 20 minutes, then you have some beers. Nothing wrong with that, it's a very different event. But if you look here, despite Warrior Dash being first to market, um, and Facebook likes are but one metric of our brand awareness, we're significantly larger than the next two biggest players, Spartan Race and Warrior Dash combined, which is something that we're very proud of. Um, and here you see some of the examples of that stuff we do. We try and be this brand that is not edgy and opinionated for the sake of being edgy and opinionated. We're trying to be sincere and we're trying to be authentic in what we're doing. And I think what you see here, for those of you that can't see too clearly, you have um, the sign down there, the Donna Party feasted here, that's from, from one of our California <laughs> events. And then you see something here from our UK event that shows two giant pandas in, uh, in headbands. And <laughs> part of this, I think, part of the whole concept of Tupac was born out of the fact that I found myself somewhat bored at Harvard Business School most of the time. It's a very corporate environment for those of you that have been there. And I'm not trying to tell you that we're this anti-corporate corporate. We're not going to go and occupy Wall Street tomorrow. But we are a brand that I think does try and challenge people's values. And we look at what Iron Man stands for. And again, people say, why do you hate Iron Man? And we don't. But I do think something where people wax their legs and have to rinse their cottage cheese yeah. to do it is for us not what fitness and having fun doing it all about. Um, and certainly I'd done triathlons and I'd had people you know, who I was getting in the way of saying screw you as I was going around the course and I thought there has to be more to do in the endurance sport than this. So we've tried to position ourselves and I think we've been quite successful as this brand that is somewhat countercultural in what we stand for and I think that's a big part which Guy will talk to you later about the culture that we've tried to build at Tough Mudder. And here's another metric of how we've been, uh, how have we succeeded in social media. And it shows our YouTube views here, now uh, 8 million views for us, and it shows down here Spartan Race, our closest, com we say competitor, frankly we don't think about them. I think Google thinks more about Yahoo than we do about Spartan Race, but we're just trying to show you there how we believe that we kind of stack up against our at least 
our competitors. Um, so that's uh, where we've got to as far as uh, social media. Probably worth um, talking about how our obstacles drive that work. Yeah, um, I think a big, big part of our event is we have, we believe, genuinely cool obstacles, and we invest a lot of um, time <coughs> and effort in always making sure that we have the cool obstacles. You're probably aware of our firewalker. You've probably heard of electroshock therapy, the 10,000 volt shock. You get when you run through um, the um, the sea of wires. We had an obstacle that was called the Chernobyl jacuzzi. The jacuzzi corporation didn't like this so much, so we had to rename this the Arctic Enema. Um, um, so, uh, um, and we try and have these kind of edgy, slightly quirky things, and you know, we are poking fun a little bit about the PC culture that you see in corporate America. I mean, we have an obstacle called hold your wood, we have to carry a log up the mountain, we have a rope bridge that you've probably seen, the swinging ropes in the video there, that's called the ball shrinker, um, and uh, I tell everyone in our company, we're not trying to be the Marriott Hotel. We're not trying to be all things to all people. We're not trying to create a nice environment for everyone. It's a very polarizing brand. So you see Tough Mudder and you either say, that looks awful and miserable, or you say, that looks awesome, let me add it. And there isn't much in between. And I think you either get it or you don't with our brand. And we're very, very proud of that. Yeah. I think we're very fortunate as well that, um, I mean, so many successful businesses are a confident to sort of being at the right place at the right time. And, and for us, Facebook arrived just at the right time to advertise our business. Well, alluded to the fact that we are one of Facebook's largest advertisers, but the ability to share these things in the way that Will mentioned with the humble brag is so so enormous. The fact that you can post photos of you doing the event on your wall, you don't even need to tell anyone that you're doing that you're specifically you've done it, and you're telling people indirectly that you're pretty damn cool, basically, and you go through all of that kind of stuff. So I think that's uh, enormous for us. And then um, we've also seen this. Like, speaking to Will's thoughts about sort of collected experiences, people taking photos of themselves, shooting video as well, and sharing it on social media networks. And that's just adds to the virality of, of what we're doing. It's, we're very, very fortunate that it happened just at the right time for us. If we tried to start the business two years before, I'm not sure we could have had the kind of the success we've had so rapidly. Well, I think you're right. And I think actually now, even two years later, Facebook's become so much more of a sophisticated ad platform. <laughs> And at the time, there were just great arbitrage opportunities back in 2010 to really reach a lot of people very cheaply. Um, I'll now talk to you about some of our brand partners. And one of the things I was always very clear about early on is I didn't want our event at the end that you got some kind of isotonic banana at the end of our event. And I said, look, let's have a beer when we finish this event. You know? no. so you've trained hard, you deserve it, right? You've been beaten up in the mud for the last uh, 10, 12 miles. And so, that's how we started. Just a keys, I'm sure you're all aware of. They have their most interesting man in the world campaign. Um, they saw our event as being the most interesting event out there. It probably helped that their head of brand is also a British guy who was at my undergrad, and I think that always helps over here. Um, but they came on board very early on, and they were great for us just at the right time. Um, sponsorship now is a multi million dollar business for us, and I think it's going to be a tens of millions of dollar business for us in the next year or two. But Really, it's not about the money that brings in. Um, it's about what that does for us on an activation <coughs> side and what it says about who your friends are. And I think, particularly with Under Armour, but with all of the partners that we have, we have some of the best friends we could hope for. And you see here an example of one of our branded obstacles. This is um, the Everest obstacle. It's one of our degrees products. And <coughs> so this really shows the teamwork and camaraderie part of our event as well. You can see people linking arms and helping each other up this obstacle and you can see a guy lying down there at the top of this thing waiting to catch someone else coming up but um it's been huge for us we wouldn't be where we are as a brand without the partners we have um, and uh, they're generally a pretty fun bunch to work with as well yeah and i guess i guess the other side of that i mean it doesn't come without its um uh, its downsides as well i mean working with partners is um it can be tough and you know they are big corporate brands and we're trying to be the anti-corporate corporate. So there's always a delicate balance. I think we've just about um, managed it, but it's always something that was always in the back of our mind. Are we selling out by getting corporate brands in or not? On balance, I don't think we are. You know, the activation, as Will says, is huge for us. Um, but it's always something that we need to think about. And certainly when we think about working with major brands, we always say we have to work with either the number one or the number two brand in the category. Otherwise, you just look as though you're kind of second best, and that doesn't help us in any way. I, I think it's also important to recognize that 
you know, I'm going slightly off topic here, but when we started this business, this was about doing something interesting and rewarding. People at business school would always say, do you want to be rich or do you want to be king? And at Harvard, you're supposed to say rich. Um, and I'd say, well, I didn't mean to sound megalomaniacal, but I honestly, I'd far rather be king. I quite like being in charge of my own life. And if I don't make a ton of money doing it, that's okay. Um, as it happened, this was something that we could really get behind. It was exciting, it was interesting, it was rewarding. Right? We get to work with people that we like, trust, and respect. And last year, we had almost 20,000 resumes into Tough Mudder. I think that speaks to the kind of organization we are. And you do this because it's fun and it's rewarding, it's interesting. And we could have been the miller like Tough Mudder, but it just wouldn't have worked for us. Um, and the partners we have, and you guys are entirely right, you're working with companies way, way bigger than us. And I'm sure they sometimes see the things we've posted on Facebook and go, really, guys? <laughs> but um, overall, I think it's been huge for us in terms of what we've achieved from an activation point. But I really do want to stress that. And, uh, I think this is a good point, Danny, to you, know, you guys that are thinking about doing something different. I mean, doing something that's interesting and rewarding and fun. And I think of all my friends from Harvard that are here in New York, and nearly all of them are pretty miserable, truth be told. And I think we have created an environment, we have people that genuinely have escaped. And in the UK, the city is basically Wall Street, I'm sure you're aware. And they've got out of that world. And we have 10 or 12 of them here this evening. I really hope if you're going to get a chance to speak with us, that you speak with some of them. And it's a huge part for me of the business. Because once you've made some money, actually that additional money over and above it isn't much of a motivator. <laughs> But having, seeing people who are enjoying their lives much more so than they ever did, and they tell you all the time, they say thank you. you know, I find that I'm a much happier person in life now. It's a massive, massive part of this. And I could talk a lot about how Tough Mudder does good in other ways, the Wounded Warrior Project, and simply having an event that I think does change people's lives for better. And I think if you can have that, the money really does flow. And I know it's a cliche, and I'm sure you've heard that from other people, but I really believe that very strongly. It was easy for this business to be successful, and this is my fifth business by far and away the most successful, because we were doing something that every day it never felt like work. Right? It just never does. We never talk about work-life balance, right? Because we live our lives at work, right? And if you have work-life balance, it somehow implies that work is awful, right? Um, and we were trying very hard to avoid that with the company that we created, but Guy will talk a lot more about that over the next few slides. So moving on to the kind of final section here, building a sustainable <coughs> company culture. And in many ways, um, this, I think, is the most interesting part uh, of what we do. It's, it's um, running the... Will and I both now, as sort of CEO, CEO and COO, are quite a long way away from um, planning the actual events. And um, it was quite a big step for us, actually, to, to not attend every single event that we go to. But that, to some extent, that's just the product of what we do. We now are just... We are running a business. We're running a rapidly growing business. This time last year, we had eight people. Uh, and now we're pushing 60, and as Will mentioned earlier, we're hoping to sort of double that by the end of this year. So building a sustainable company culture is the one thing, basically, that's going to, um, upon which we're going to either survive or uh, be like so many other startups, <coughs> just a sort of flash in the pan. And when we think about this, we think of uh, three things that we really need to work on. Culture, people, and planning. And we have huge initiatives at the moment just um, in place and about how that we can make Tough Mud a really fun uh, place to work. Um, and that all three of these are huge, uh, are really important. We have to invest in our people, uh, we have to invest in our culture, and we have to plan for the future such that the people who come on board aren't disaffected and, and think you know, this is a, like, a, an unstructured, uh, terrible company to work for, for all the kind of fun publicity that it generates. So what are the things that we do at Tough Mudder, which I think makes it a genuinely unique place to work? So for, to start with, we have Tough Mudder University, and we're really, really, really trying to invest in the people who come and work for us. And uh, this takes uh, a number of different forms. We, um, as, as you know, we'll went to Harvard Business School. So once a month, we as a company study a Harvard Business School case. We divide into learning groups. Uh, we discuss various cases, which could be uh, on logistics, it could be on company culture, um, it could be on branding or marketing, all sorts of different stuff. Uh, and then we all get together and we discuss it in a, in a kind of forum, not unlike you would at business school. And that's enormous. Um, and we also do book, uh, book club reviews when we're talking about sort of things like, for example, The Effective Executive by Peter Drucker. We did 22 uh, rules of branding. Um, We've done uh, seven habits of highly effective people. And I think this is, a, this is huge for, for a couple of reasons. But one, it brings the entire company together across departments. 
not only just um, sort of marketing to accounts to events to operations, um, but also a way to really um, sort of invest in the human capital of everyone who works there, and sort of really, really demonstrably um, show that we are invested in the human capital um, of Tough Mudder. <coughs> We're also doing uh, launching another thing, which is really, I think, is really, really exciting. Is Tough Mudder Ventures. Um, I think, you know, Will and I both feel that there's a huge amount that we can teach uh, others who've gone, having gone through this, um, this phase of, uh, you know, very successful, but very stressful startup period. And we want to invest in the people, uh, in people and other people's ideas, more well, particularly all the people who want to come and work for us. I mean, I think as any VC would say, or angel uh, would say, investor would say, you invest in the people, not in the product. Um, so we want to sort of uh, generate and incubate it for people to come in, um, learn the way that we do business. And I think in many ways we're a much more interesting company to work for right now than we were a year ago as a rapidly growing entrepreneurial country, uh, co company. Sorry. Um, so we want to invest in people, come and work for us for a couple of years, a couple of years, and then um, uh, and then we'll invest in you if you think you've got a, a good sort of business plan. We're also having a sort of tough mudder. Uh, business plan competition for everyone who works with us. We want to encourage people to think about ways that they can make, uh, they can have their own uh, company as well. Do you want to talk about exhibitions? Yeah, absolutely. So this comes back to a point I was making earlier about memories being uh, the new luxury good, the shared collective experiences. Um, and, and as I said, and once you start making actually not that much money, the motivation to make more money goes away quite quickly. There may be other motivations to grow your brand big and all the rest of it. But we wanted to build an organization where people thought differently about what their job was. And I didn't even want people using the term career. I wanted people to think about a lifestyle. And I wanted in a good way, and some of you probably have experience from a bad way, where that line between what you do with your day and what you do in your evening has become blurred. And the Tough Metal Exhibition was a big, big part of this. Um, once you've been with the company for two years, you get to have this break. So there's two weeks up there. It's actually a three-week uh, expedition. We're trying to figure out where we're going. But our next one, I want to go to the South Pole. It looks like it may be somewhat expensive to do that, but I'm hoping we can do that. And we do this with our partner organization. The plan is uh, the Wounded Warrior Project, which the, those of you that don't know is a veterans uh, organization here. It helps guys, very young guys normally, that have come back from uh, Iraq and Afghanistan not in the same shape that they left. And it is a remarkable organization. So it's something we're doing, and I think allows people in our organization to get closer to a big part of what the company's about. Because sometimes when you're sitting in your desk in Brooklyn, it's easy to forget what a lot of the company is about. And it's about touching people's lives. It's about changing people's lives. And one thing I'm very proud of, if you go down to Walter Reed in Bethesda, Maryland, I guarantee you every single guy in there knows what Tough Mudder is. And every single one of them is saying, I'm going to do a Tough Mudder one day. Maybe not next year, maybe not in the year after that, but one day I'm going to do one. And it's a big part of what we're about, but we don't have the rules of our event. You know, there are, there's no, uh, unlike Iron Man, where if someone helps each other, you're disqualified. It's quite the opposite. There's a big part of what we're going to be about. And that was what Tough Mudder Expedition was about. It's about living and breathing that culture, not just at the events, but in everything we did. And then, um, sort of Tough Mudder Wellness here. I mean, um, as you obviously can to hear, Will and I are both English. Um, we're used to UK uh, holiday time of 25 days a year, so somewhat of a surprise to come here and hear that standard holidays were fewer 10 days. We were having none of that, you know. So standard policy um, is we have five weeks uh, holiday for everyone uh, a year. You know, we have a <coughs> monthly wellness uh, reimbursement. We pay for people's uh, gym membership. Uh, we enrol people in Zog Sports. You know, we give everyone an iPad um, when they start uh, when they start. Uh, work with us. You know, all of these small things that kind of make a real difference and show that, that genuinely we care um, about uh, all of the uh, people who come to work for us. And as you can see here, just a sort of slide of the types of um, people, <coughs> the, the backgrounds of some of uh, some of our sort of key team. I think we're really um, we're really proud of the uh, of the people um, of the team that we built, and they're so so diverse and. Obviously, within the context of where we are today, we've put some of the more corporate organisations down here. You know, we've got Barcap, we've got Merrill Lynch, we've got um, Ernst & Young, uh, we've got Bain & Company. But we also have some more some diverse stuff, Seamless Web, our deputy CMOs from um, 
uh, the New York Triathlon, where uh, our head of <coughs> obstacle innovation is from as well. So we've got this really broad base uh, of people from all sorts of different <coughs> backgrounds who um, genuinely love coming to work. Um, and that's, um, I think that's the thing I'm probably most proud of, um, of the entire company, of the success we've had, is the fact that people really enjoy coming to work. You can, we've seen people um, develop, become happier people in and, in and of themselves. And um, I think probably Will and I both agree that that's probably the, um, you know, the greatest thing so that, that we've done so far within the context of Tough Mother. I think. Cool. So, final uh, final uh, slide here is um, obviously I want to encourage as many of you uh, here as possible to come and work for us. Um, you know, we work for the brightest and the best. Yeah, this is um, you know we we say actually uh, we've had more than uh, twenty thousand resumes um, uh, last year. We've already had seven thousand I think this year alone. Um, as Will says, it's harder to get into Tough Mudder than it is into Harvard Business School. Um, you know, it's really hard, it's fast paced. Um, we're working with people who are incredibly smart, dynamic, um, fun. Um, I mean, it's one of the cri chi sort of principal criteria that we evaluate people is, um, would we be happy to sit next to you together? Because we work really hard and really closely together, particularly in a team, uh, sort of a, a work environment. You have to like the people. And I think the thing I'd add in last, and I think a lot of companies talk about their company culture, and really what they mean is having a foosball table and beers on a Friday evening. And that's nice to do, that's fun. Um, but I think a culture you know, in an organization means taking pride in what you do. And I think very often, particularly in New York and in London, professionalism tends to mean taking ourselves pretty damn seriously. And one of our values up on our wall at Tough Mudder, our credo, is that we don't take ourselves seriously. We take our work and ourselves seriously. And I think we take, have a lot of pride in what we do. And I think that guides everything we do. We study, for those of you that are familiar, the Toyota production system, all about making everything in your workplace better all the time and aspiring to find every problem so you can fix it. And I think that's what a culture is about. You know? having, having nice vacations, um, having beer and foosball, that's a manifestation of good culture, right? but you can't just bolt that onto a bad culture and hope it works. And it's something we're very focused on. And, and we all read the Zappos book. For those of you that are familiar with them, they uh, put a huge focus on their culture. Um, and I think we've learned a great deal from them from that. And I think you know, that's, for me, the thing we are most proud of. You know, it's nice that you know you now don't have to worry about making your student loan payments, and you can tell Citigroup where to go. But um, I think. Um, <laughs> Having an organisation for the people that enjoy their lives, that are proud to be there, um, is probably one of the most rewarding things I think that I've ever done with my life. And you know, I think others that have been fortunate enough to do that themselves with their lives would agree. I think that probably covers yeah. pretty much uh, where we are. We'll take. I think we'll take some questions now, and then you know, we'd quite like to mingle and have a beer as well and, and yeah, talk at the end of the day. Yeah. So first of all, thank you very much for this. Um, my friends and I did this first time already a year ago, and we still talk about it. It's kind of like a really great experience for all of us. We kind of share experiences, really relevant and really um, kind of awesome. So thank you for that. But my question is um, about your brand relationships, and at what point at, uh, during your initial growth did you feel comfortable approaching these big brands and these, these companies that are much larger than you were at that time? Um, and how did you kind of develop those relationships over there? Um, how would one do that? How does one do that? Um, it, it's funny, thing, selling sponsorships is like this slightly weird dating ritual and you have a lot of kind of getting to know each other and certainly just the keys they approached us. Um, but we, I was always clear that if we were going to become a household brand name, we had to partner with the right brands. Um, now we have a sponsorship sales department that's full of professionals that have worked in the industry and understand how to value assets and all the rest of it and understand the things that the guy and I are not experts in in terms of how they'll think about their uh, impressions and all the rest of it. Um, I don't know if there's a magic answer. The reality is you build relationships. You know? um, now we're fortunate that we're a brand that we're on people's radar, so they tend to take our phone calls. But early on, just like every part of the business, you get a lot of people slamming the door in your face on every front. And I think you know, that's just a huge part of any business in the first year. We were fortunate that 
we kind of got through that stage in six, eight months. Um, but it, it's still, you have to just have this resilience. And I think every problem you face is on some level unique to you, but really it's just a generalizable problem that everyone deals with. And I think you just have to accept um, that you're going to be making a lot of phone calls and dealing with a lot of people that are not going to return your phone calls early on. And then you figure out what people want. And uh, people want. And normally, it becomes pretty clear quite early on, even though the dating ritual is pretty long, whether it's going to work out or not. Um, but then you're dealing with big corporates, so contracts take eight months to turn around. Um, but it is about finding people where there's a right fit. And it is about having the teams that, uh, on the other side that understand what we're doing. And we are this edgy, quirky brand. I mean, I told you the names of some of our obstacles. Right? There are definitely brands that would run a million miles from us, and then there are those that see what we're trying to do and embrace that. And when the fit's there, it's pretty obvious pretty quickly. Alicia? Um, I just have to do with this one. It's, uh, I mean, have you ever had the, ever had the luxury of being able to turn away uh, a sponsor? Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that point already. I mean, our, our business model is based upon participant revenues, and that's over 90% of our um, um, of where our money comes from. And they pay us in advance, and even nicer, some of them don't even show up. Um, but um, so, yeah, we can we can pick our choose our friends, and I think some people are surprised by this. And we've turned down some big deals because we knew that they were piggybacking on the coolness and the originality of our brand, um, and we don't want people piggybacking on us. We want people that are going to help us raise the tide together. Thanks. Great, great information. I, I was wondering, do most people complete your challenges one time or multiple times, and how do you continue to engage with them and market this product um, over over a longer period of time? So we've seen uh, retention rates of about 20, uh, 25 percent, which is which is enormous actually. But there's a um, but there's a reason um, that people can't come back year on year because it's a team event um, for people. And you know, it's, I think over 80% of people uh, sign up as part of the team, whether it's uh, colleagues or high school friends or college friends. And if the date doesn't work, then they just won't happen. Um, so you can't always get, uh, you, know, you might aspire to 100% year on year to retention, but that's never going to happen. But in terms of how are we going to keep on attracting people year on year and make sure it's not a fad? Well, I mean, for a start, I think there's something very primal about our, our event. You know, it, it really appeals to. Uh, something deep-rooted um, in men, and I apologise to women in the room, it is mostly men who do our event, to prove that they are slightly, to, to prove that they are tough to other people. Um, but we need to keep on innovating, and the way that we do that, the way that we think we're going to be known is for having the coolest obstacles. So we're going to be uh, in the works of creating a kind of a skunk works of new obstacles such that we can be uh, posting them online. So generating buzz, generating that virality of, of new ideas. So people are sort of, can't wait until Tough Mudder is gonna launch the new obstacle uh, all of the time. So we see that as probably the, uh, the biggest thing that we need to do in that front. What was the, uh, what was the most difficult decision you guys had to make in running this? Hardest decision. Honestly, I think early on you're making so many decisions that you know <coughs> are going to hugely impact on where the business ultimately ends up um, and things that at the time you have absolutely no ability to go and gather data for because you have to make a thousand of those decisions on the first day. And it's funny now, you know, now we have a whole bunch of strategists from Bain working for us right? and so I can send them away and they can put together a PowerPoint for me and they can tell me what they think we should do. But you don't have any of that when you first start. Um, and so I think it's a difficult thing to point to a genuinely one decision. You recognize everything you're doing. I remember the debate we had over the logo, uh, and with, um, I forget, we, we had some very minor success at the time. And Guy and I had gone for the first beer um, that we'd been for in like six weeks. Um, and the next morning, we were sitting at my kitchen table trying to design the logo ourselves. And I could pick a thousand examples, but that's what we want to do. And just trying to decide what, what are our colours going to be? And you know, neither of us you know, would wear orange and grey and black. Right? And uh, it's not our kind of preferred palette. But we looked at it and said, well, if we go with orange and grey and black, we're going to be different. It's going to say something about our brand. Right? But there was no research. We didn't do a focus group on this. You know, we sat around with very slight hangovers on Saturday morning, um, trying to figure out whether this was a good idea or not. So I think it's this sense that you make so many decisions early on that when you come back, and you may look at them in two years' time, and you know, that was terrible. 
but you just don't have the data, you don't have the luxury to stop and really think. Um, and then the way you operate as a business, you get 60, 70 people, it's completely different. Everything's data driven, everything's principle ready. It's a completely different way of managing. But in those early days, everything you do is that slightly unnerving sense that this is not how they taught me to do it at business school. Just uh, if I was to say that the, uh, the biggest mistake that we made, I would say is, uh, and this is probably common to probably 95% of any startup, is uh, not getting a really good accountant early on. Um, we've been slightly stunned by that. We're okay now, uh, we're fortunate, but um, I think I, I can see quite a few nods of, uh, around this room. Um, not getting someone who's really good really early on is probably our biggest mistake. I think it's something that all of my friends that are entrepreneurs will say. And you're desperate to hire great people and you know that getting great people in is ultimately the biggest limiting factor to your business and you interview someone and you kind of go, ah, I don't really know, maybe they'll be good, maybe they will and three months later you really regret that decision, always. You know, so if you have that feeling when you're interviewing someone, just go, up, go on how you feel. Can you provide some insight on like production? Um, so in terms of how we set up an event, so, so a year out from the event we'll find a site, uh, typically within um, within two hours of a sort of major city, because we've done a ton of research now that says that that's probably, if we want, people will travel up to sort of ten hours, but we want to have um, people, if we're within two hours we'll get an awful lot of people. Uh, and, we'll take, and because our, the, uh, the economics of our business are, you know, you, um, you break even at say sort of two to three thousand people, the profit, once you pick up break even, um, um, things scale very quickly and profits are exponential. So it's good to get 20,000 people to an event, obviously. So um, we find very nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, to find a site a year out. And then it's hand, basically the site search people who signed a contract with the venue, we hand it over to marketing. And then really for the next nine months, we don't do anything. And um, all we do is put a thing on our website, draw a squiggly line, <laughs> and we start marketing it. And literally nothing more than that. Um, and then about three months out, we have our first sort of planning meeting. We'll send a team of uh, people from New York to say, um, I don't know, Mount Snow in Vermont, where we're having our sort of New England events. Um, and they'll be meeting with local police, local fire, all of the kind of uh, making sure all the permits are in order, making sure that uh, we, we have uh, contracts for sort of fourth parties and, and all the things like that. Um, and then they go back to New York and you can do a lot of stuff from, the, um, from <coughs> our office in New York. Then about a month out, um, our contractor arrives on site, and that's when they start building all of the obstacles. Um, and it takes roughly three to four weeks to get everything built in order. We're trying to get that um, uh, down, but it's probably, to make sure everything's fine, three to four weeks. About a week out, a tent and table supplier turns up, uh, they put up all of the tents, and it's basically like a mini festival, essentially. From a, from a field, it suddenly becomes uh, a, a sort of a festival site. We have lots of fencing everywhere, tents, tables, the obstacles are built everywhere, we have inflatables go out the day before, um, and the course starts getting marked a week before. Um, and then we have an event on Saturday, event on the Sunday, and we start pack up almost immediately that the last runner goes out on the Sunday. And we can collapse pretty much everything by the Monday, Monday after completely following the event. So within 36 hours, we're basically out of there, so we've never been. Um, I mean, it did present some, um, some difficulties with scalability, but nothing that we haven't um, uh, sort of got over or overcome, essentially. Um, what it means is finding national contractors who can provide all of the tents and tables, all of the port bodies, and having established relationships with our partners. And we always call them our partners because we want to work very closely with them and develop really good relationships. Probably worth pointing out that our events in the UK and Australia, we don't have any we don't have any <coughs> staff in those countries. We just fly everyone out. It really is a giant travelling circus that we have coming in, and most people will fly in on the Friday before the event, and they'll be gone either on the Sunday evening or the Monday morning. Um, going back to the I think it's 
it's uh, something I say a lot to people when we talk about running a business is you know, people sometimes are surprised that we're quite open about talking about the logistics of putting on an event. The reality is 99% of any business idea is execution and for us 99% of that execution is marketing and really all of that boils down to empathy. And I knew that I would do this event. I didn't know how many other people were out there. I hadn't done any sophisticated market research. But the experiment wasn't really to hold the first event. We kind of knew that that was going to be a very steep le learning curve when it came to actually producing this unique event that no one had done before. But it was simply to say, will people come? And I, for all of these things that I observed on a very anecdotal basis, you know, in terms of people talking about experience of this new luxury good beer, going to a nice restaurant, going bungee jumping, climbing Mount Kilimanjaro, all the trends I talked about in fitness. And I think at the time, there were just these fantastic arbitrage opportunities on Facebook that simply don't exist anymore. And I think, I, I mean, we were blown away. We hoped for 500 people and we got 5,000 in five weeks. But I think it just speaks to the extent there are so many people out there that wanted to do a mass participation event that were very turned off for a number of reasons by marathon and triathlon. It's for a certain type of fitness. Nothing wrong with that fitness, but it's a certain type of fitness. It's timed. If you do a marathon, the first thing anyone ever asks you is what time you do it in, which misses the point for a lot of people. And there was just this pent up demand, and it, as Guy spoke, it was a, it's a disruptive technology. And I try and say this to my Harvard Business School professors, and they just shake, my, shake their heads in disbelief that I hadn't paid any attention to understand what an iPad was. Um, but uh, I think that was a big part of it. We just, there was this huge demand for this problem that people didn't know they had. We also, uh, to that point particularly, just on, on Facebook and how we use Facebook advertising. Um, it's very, very targeted, such that we were holding our first event uh, in Allentown, Pennsylvania, and we could target what we thought was the key words, its key demographics, to sort of men living within 50 miles of New York City, Philadelphia, and Allentown itself, who between the ages of 20 and 40, who are interested in running, uh, fitness, CrossFit, um, we thought cops and firemen would be big uh, demographics as well. So we could really target in at those people. So that's one of the reasons we could get so <coughs> it spends so cheaply um, and reach the target so so easily. Found the black tea. Uh, with Facebook ads, clearly you're playing the team with the uh, you know, social influencers who are going out and forming teams. Were you enabling them in any way, and prompting them to put people together and give them materials or messages that they can share? How did you prompt the viralness? So we, we offer some small discounts uh, as people go as a team. And it wasn't that the captain would get a discount if he brought his buddies, because we actually saw that was going to make it harder for him to, to recruit. But we, at its core, there are some, there are some discounts, there are some tools. But in essence, you know, what we have is we have a website, we have cool videos, we have tools that become very easy for people to show their videos. Something like a third of people that see our videos see it from an iPhone in a bar people are showing it to each other. And I think that's probably for us the most powerful tool um, when we talk about our event. And I think the biggest thing is that it's very hard to join a team and be part of a team sport and commit to that, particularly here in New York City, but it's true everywhere, because it's very hard to get out and do training at six o'clock on a Thursday for most people. Um, so we do, we do some stuff and we certainly look at that and we're gonna be doing some stuff hopefully later this year with Under Armour where you can get a, a team t-shirt uh, with your name and the team and all the rest of it on it, if you sign up as a big enough group early on. But at its core, I mean, we really just let the captains do the work for us. You, know, you made a point of saying you're not a technology company, but clearly leverage technology very effectively in digital media as part of your growth strategy. So I'm curious to, to know what kind of trend you see with respect to technology, you're just losing mobile, uh, and how that plays into your strategy with It's a great question, and I wish I had some clever answer. I was speaking at a conference a couple of weeks ago, and someone asked me a similar question. Luckily, I was on a panel with five other guys that were VCs at the time, so they could just talk, cover it for us. I think, for me, and this is something I'd say to all of you, you guys, most of you are in professions full of lots and lots of very, very bright people, right? Um, and on top of that, lots of probably quite ruthless, cutthroat people on top of that. Right? And that means doing, doing very well in those industries is very, very tough. As Guy alluded to, most marathons are run by the guy who was the best marathon runner in his town in 1985. And I think if I was to look at one of the core competencies of our business, it's an ability to spot non-digital trends. 
so yes, I mean, people often say, how do you use technology? And I say, well, I have an iPhone and my computer is connected to a printer. Right? But um, we are using social media. Right? But it's not, it's not really technology, is it? Let's be clear. I mean, most of what Facebook means to us is about just connecting with people right? rather than anything particularly clever. And I see that a lot. You know? like sometimes venture capitalists come to me and they tell me that we do have a tech business because we have a website. Um, and I said, I really don't think that makes a business. My father's a lawyer and he has a website. <laughs> um, uh, and so, you know, I wish I could answer that question well, but honestly, I'd be making up some fluff for you. Right at the back. Not very, not very. Exactly. If no one came, the way we looked at this is, as long as we give ourselves a few months, you know, we're reasonably intelligent people, we can probably figure out an event. And I look back and I'm kind of like, how hard could it be? Um, and uh, the answer is actually quite complicated. But, uh, um, yeah, for us, the minimal viable product was let's build a very simple website and let's see if there's any traction for that. And really, with the first event, the big hypothesis we're testing is that people will come to our event. It's not so much can we execute an event, because I was reasonably confident that over time and through iterating, we would eventually get there on that side. But we didn't do anything. I mean, it was quite bold. I mean, we didn't have anything. It was two guys sitting in an apartment in, uh, in Brooklyn with two laptops, and that was pretty much as far as our infrastructure went. And our first event wasn't particularly good, to be quite honest. I mean, people had a very good time. Um, because it was a really nice day and our original sponsor, uh, beer sponsor Dogfish, uh, provided loads and loads of free beer. So everyone got really hammered and had a really good time. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was enormous and I'm on, you know, so much of, as I said earlier, so much of success is about luck. And the fact that we had a really nice day uh, and we had lots of free beer was enormous because literally uh, 12 hours later it was a huge electrical storm. And we, if that had happened 12 hours before, we'd have had to cancel. Um, the entire event, and that could have tough mudder may not have even sort of that might have been it um, for it. So, um, so we basically didn't plan, we didn't plan very well at all. Um, but it didn't matter because we knew we could improve the execution side. Of it. Um, I was recently watching uh, Dave Asprey's talk about uh, video. People sometimes think we hate Ironman and we don't. I mean, Ironman have tried many shorter distance events and no one comes to them. So, you know, what you say on TV and actually what your strategy is sometimes not the same thing. Um, and they tried a mother on it, didn't go very well, and they left the space pretty quickly. Um, I think there are a ton of new innovative event ideas that we have that maybe will be around shorter events. Um, now, I, the guys in the company hear me tell this story all the time, not because I think it's something that we should be doing, but it just speaks to the demand for events. Some guy, he graduated, I think he dropped out of college, like 23, 24. He went to Spain, he saw there's a town in Spain where they have this big tomato fest every year and they throw tomatoes at each other. And he said, wow, this is a pretty easy thing to copy in the United States. Mm -hmm. So he built, I'm sure, a very simple website. He found 10 fields near major metros in the US, got a lot of tomatoes, and charge people 50 bucks to turn up and trade them at each other. And we can back out what his economics are. He's probably got over 50% margins on that business. Um, and uh, he's a millionaire uh, within a year. So it's not that we want to be putting on tomato fest, but I think genuinely uh, unique, innovative uh, experiences that you can share with your friends is what our business is about. And that may be you know, doing shorter events. You know, I mean, we often talk about a very logical adjacent to us to doing an all-women's mud run. 
uh, because we see that our, you know, our events are very macho, and I'm sure it turns uh, some women off. Uh, we don't want to come and do that. So no, that's a very cl close adjacency to what we're doing. But we have a lot of event planning capabilities that aren't limited to just running in the mud. Um, and so a big part of what we're doing with Tough Mud Adventures, and Guyani just touched on this, is we're trying to foster a genuinely entrepreneurial culture. So that means investing in ideas that don't fit within our core um, competencies and don't sit within the company. But it also means using the sim a similar kind of sort of criteria and way about thinking about investing in new ideas and all this minimal viable product stuff that we talked about in the same way. And I think if you look at what Tough Mudder will be in two, three years' time, well, it's probably Tough Enterprises and there's the Tough Mudder division within that and there's several other things that we're doing alongside that as well. Is that why it's important for you to go global so quickly so that you can be the first mover not only here in the US but Got a footprint now around the world because this guy took that idea from Spain, and that's obviously a threat. Yeah, absolutely. We want to be a global, uh, global brand. There's a huge. I mean, we've seen a million and one kind of so-called competitors um, to our uh, to our company or to our event spring up. Actually, not many hitting it. The sort of 10 to 12 mile uh, genuine challenge is what we think Tough Mudder is, but certainly more at the sort of 5k level. But and in and amongst that, there is a bit of a land grab, and uh, we want to have secure the best venues near the biggest cities around uh, around the world. Um, and it's an obvious to us to move to Australia, the UK, and Canada uh, this year because obviously the English speaking, the culture is very similar. Uh, the sort of subtle nuances of, of the advertising, the brand, don't have to change uh, change very much at all. But also, um, certainly within this uh, within the states, uh, when people are signing up, so. You know, the person who lives a couple of about so somewhere between sort of um, Atlanta and Georgia and Birmingham, Alabama for our Georgia event, you know, he gets a kick from the fact that the, you know, the next event is going to be in Melbourne, Australia. Um, and it really adds to the fact that we are a genuine global brand in a big way. So I think it's positive. You know, we know a big part of our strategy is to become this household name. Um, uh, and if we're not the first in South Africa, in South Africa, the market that someone else gets to, it's probably not a big deal. You know, I, this, we compete against things that guys do at weekends. So to some extent, that's going paintballing or you know, playing sports with their buddies, but that could also be you know, visiting your girlfriend's parents. I mean, we compete against that, right? I mean, that's a choose for something you do with your weekends. And I think something I say to a lot of people who want to be entrepreneurs is, if you've got a product that you already know who your established competitors are before you enter the market, it's probably unlikely that you're going to win in that space. And you know, I told you before that we probably think less about Spartan than Google do about Yahoo. Um, and I mean that seriously. We are a new market product. In the moment, we're not grabbing market share. We're creating a new market from scratch. If someone hasn't heard of a Tough Mudder, um, it's unlikely that prior to that they were thinking, but what I really want to do is run in the mud and the obstacles, and I just hope someone comes to my town and sits. Um, I think that's important. And I think a lot of companies when this will become obsessed about competition. Right, right. Verizon and AT&T, right, one person's win is someone else's loss. It's not really like that for us. I think that's important to remember when you're starting a company. So, my second question, was it a strategic decision to be based in the UN so that we knew what and that played into your success? So, unequivocally, being in New York has been a huge run for our success. I mean, you're only as good as the people you can get in. Ultimately, I believe that for any organization becomes a limiting factor to their growth for to get great people into an organization, and New York's one of the few genuine hub cities in the world that attracts talents from very different backgrounds, and that's important. And we talked about today about the people who've come and joined our <coughs> organization, who've come from uh, more traditional uh, i-banking, uh, legal and consultancy backgrounds. But we're a very broad church of people within our organization with very different skills. Um, so I think New York's great from that perspective. I think having been to business school over here, there's a strong appeal to stay for at least a few years. Um, it so happened that I had a girlfriend who's now my fiance. Um, she's a corporate lawyer. She was moving down here. Um, Boston's very cold and snowy in the winter. And so I thought if I could get a little bit further south, that would be a nice thing. Um, and uh, so I don't know if we can say it was a strategic choice as it, as it is. I think it's been great for us. And I often wonder whether we do well because we're in New York or in spite of the fact we're in New York, in this world where most people are in uh, one of three or four big industries, and I think, well, if we were out on the West Coast, would it be different? But actually, you know, I think we're in the Bay Area, 
would just be surrounded by lots of people that want to be uh, programmers, and I'm not sure that would be any more helpful to us. And I think we do get just a ton of people that want to come and work with us because they're bright, they're very well accomplished people, but they don't want to be working in some job that destroys their life, and ultimately it's very difficult for them to see how they're creating real value in this world. Sure. Yeah. really good question. Um, sometimes people think I'm riling on it. It's not that. I just, I think that if you want to do certain things with your career, other business school is a great place to go. Um, if you know you want to get into finance, or you know you want to get into consultancy, and you know you want to be on the east coast of the United States, then there are many very compelling reasons to go there. Um, I think if you want to start your own organization, and it gives you a pedigree, you know, um, you know, at that once you've got an MBA from somewhere like Harvard Business School or any good business school for that matter, it says something about your intellect. It probably says even more about your work ethic. Um, and depending on what you want to do in life, that can be very useful. I think in terms of actual entrepreneurial lessons learned, so business lessons learned, you know, business isn't rocket science. You know, as I told you, I think it's mostly empathy. I really do. Um, I think one thing I got from it, you know, and I, you know, I spent most of my time chasing after you know, members of Al-Qaeda for five years. You know, and I've had small businesses, but you know, I imagine there was some kind of secret source to business. And I, I think for a lot of people, that's slightly intimidating. They go, I must go to business school to get my MBA, and then I'll know about business, and I'll be a business expert. Um, and I'm not really sure you learn much, but I think it does give you a confidence. And it's not that I thought I was smarter than the other people in the room, but I certainly didn't think I was dumber than the other people in the room. And I thought, well, is this really representative? future business elite of America, I think I can do okay alongside these guys. Um, and um, so I think that was, that was somewhat useful, um, that experience. Um, I think one of the things you do see is, you, know, you come out of business school, and I, you know, I kind of just ignored the debt. And I was like, it'll be okay. Right? Now, one way or another, life will work its way out. And I think that's an important thing I'd say to anyone who's thinking about starting a company. It's highly unlikely when you're 45, you're not going to have enough money to own a house and be able to pay your medical bills and educate your kids. Right? It just certainly once you've been somewhere like that, and given the other very um, fortunate circumstance I've been born into, you know, having a family that were always there for me, good education in the UK, it's unlikely it's not going to work out at least moderately well. And I think a lot of people finish business school and they start telling themselves lies. They say, I won't start a business at 28 um, because I've got debt. I'll start it when I pay my debt at 31. The trouble is most people tend to be getting married and having kids at that age and buying houses. So they say, oh, I'll do it in a couple of years' time. But it's no better then, and suddenly you're 55, um, and you don't like flying economy anymore. Um, and uh, I think I see a lot of people doing that. I spent my summer internship with a big management consultancy, and I was amazed by how many people thought they were going to stay there two years and then go and set up their own company and how few actually had. And that, in of itself, was a pretty useful lesson for me. So, no, I wouldn't honestly hand on heart recommend if you want to start your own company I would say go and work in a high growth organization for two years see the challenges they face see the kind of personalities you need to attract into that and the way that you have to manage and the problems you have to deal with and get that sense of confidence that if, if Will and Guy can do it and we make many many mistakes on a daily basis and probably I could go and do it as well final question um, out of fear of not getting through you guys in that line to come um, are either of yourselves or somebody from your venture staff available for like a mentorship with my own startup? So, I, I mean, what we always say, and um, it's, it's not about saying, uh, I mean, I have no idea whether I can help you or not. And I think people often come to me and say, do I have a good business idea? And I say, I don't know. I can probably tell you some of the assumptions you need to go away, some of the hypotheses you need to go away and test to have some idea of it yourself. But I, I don't really know. I mean. It's a huge thing, and obviously we're from the UK, and I often wish there was a CEO hotline that I can call, because it's a very, it's a very unnerving feeling when it's clear there's a problem, and no one knows what to do, and all the heads just look at you, you know, and you have to kind of smile like you were prepared for this one. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, I probably get to people a week, I know Guy does as well, um, and, you know, I was there, and I remember what it was like in trying to get calendar and having lots of people saying I'm too big and important and I really try not to be that guy <laughs> however we're also kind of busy I, you know we're going to be around we'll be handing out cards 
Uh, and I, I mean it when I say this. I, I will try and make sure in the next month or so that we can get together for half an hour. And it doesn't mean to say I can become a mentor. Frankly, I might be the worst mentor in the world, <laughs> saying for Guy. Um, but I can probably help you think about some of the things that you need to think about as you get started. Um, it doesn't mean to say you won't make a ton of mistakes yourself. You just probably make different mistakes. Mistakes that we made. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Thank you very okay. much, everyone. Thank you.